Floyd Michael Jordan, you're here finally after an hour, an hour late. But uh, welcome, yes, welcome I to was. the second episode of Scotch and Soda. Uh, I'm sweating. Uh-huh. The camera setups and the voice setups has taken a toll on me. How are you doing? How are you doing today? I'm absolutely delightful, Vinny. It's 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 so beautiful to see you today. I think you look absolutely exquisite. I am excited, so excited to talk to you. Thank you, thank you, Floyd. What made you come to my podcast? The second episode. The second episode called Funerals and Pimps. Funerals and Pimps. We, we did the title of that. And you say, well, why did I come to the second episode? And the, the short answer is, anytime you ask me to come, Vinny, I come. <laughs> That's a great answer. So, Funerals and Pimps, right? But before we dive into all of that, um, do you remember the first time we met? I do remember the first time we met. Could you elucidate? <laughs> <laughs> like an MCQ question. And the first time we met was uh, in Ocean Beach. Ocean Beach, San Diego. Yeah. It was delightful. It was it was delightful. I think you were kind of high. You know? And drunk. I was, I was pretty drunk. <laughs> mainly drunk. <laughs> you were high and drunk. And then you were sitting across the table. And there I saw you one time. And then I l- never looked at that side again. Yeah, I was loud. You said that's a loud, <laughs> racist white guy. Stay away from him. No, I mean... I don't know, dude. I mean, always the first impression is always I can't pick it up. Uh, maybe I'm wrong in um, picking up first impressions, but uh, here we are doing a <laughs> podcast <laughs> after year. after almost a year. Um, so we met in Obi, and uh, yeah, no, it was it was absolutely fantastic, and we we hung out with a couple of people, and then finally after a year, we are two people. We are left with uh, two people, I think. Um, so the reason why I think I was interested in doing a podcast with you is because you, as again, going back to the first impression, I never thought you were as deep as you uh, seem to be because there was a white guy who was really loud across the table, right? And um, I was like, oh, okay, all right, that's a given. <laughs> <laughs> He's a bro. He's <laughs> chugging beers. Yeah, baby. But yeah, there was something, some, there was a depth to that and... Uh, and uh, yeah, which we connected on. And uh, we also talk about not just uh, frat, uh, frat beer talks, but also people always accuse us being, you know, frat boys who always drink beers. But we are not that. We are all, all, always, we are depressed alcoholics. <laughs> well, it's easier to, it's easier to, uh, to judge, or sorry, it's, it's hard to think. That's why most people judge. It's Carl Jung. And to your point, just like you kind of judged me, you thought I was a, a thing. I think sometimes when we go out and we giggle and the things we say, that they they get the same uh, judgment. They make the same judgments of us. Yeah, I mean, you th- those are first impressions, right? Like you have like a window of time to figure out who that person is, especially in a social setting. It's just, you know, you see this person and, as, and you just swipe. Right? <laughs> but... So going back, you're from Ohio. You came. Hell yeah, I am. You came to you came to San Diego four years back. I did come to San Diego. Daytona, four years back. Daytona, Ohio. Yeah, the DYT. Do you what? Do it's you called the DYT, Dayton, Ohio. It's oh, called why the is DYT. It? It's like a DY. It's, it's kind of like a gangster thing. It's kind of like something you might you know like you want to have like a from your neighborhood credibility, like okay. the DYT, like shy, like a Chicago. Like I'm from the shy city. Oh, I thought Chicago was wind city. They call it the windy, but like if you talk from somebody from the hood, they'll say I'm from the shy. They might even say shy rack. Oh, it's a hood talk. It's so it's a, yeah, it's it's very it's a it's a urban it's urban vernacular. I think oh. is what I'm supposed to say. So what's called uh, Daytona is called DY Tona. The they call it the DYT. DYT. Don't know why it's called the DYT. DYT. The DY. I think it's a, an abbreviation. It's really not that creative. Okay. But I'm from Dayton, and also not that creative. And uh, you came to San Diego four years back. Uh, and how do you like it? I like it. I mean, it's sunny. Uh, so sometimes on the, on the cloudy days, you know, on like my lateness today, uh, I was uh, visited by some beautiful clouds of depression. And uh, but again, hey, if it's ha- if I have to have clouds of depression, the thing San Diego affords me is rarely is there actual clouds. You know, I get to see some sunshine and uh, get my vitamin D. So, yeah, I mean, I like it. Um, it's not perfect. You can have almost anything you want in life, can never have everything. Is it expensive? Yeah. Are there some pretentious people? Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I like the sunshine. I like the people. I like living close to the beach. I'm grateful, man. 
it's better to be depressed in San Diego than in the, the UA town. To me, yeah. This is my, if I have to, you know, it's like, I don't like, I've never had any activity up my, up my butt. Uh, but if I did have to have activity yeah. up my butt, if Dayton had to stick it up my butt or San Diego stuck it up my butt, I prefer San Diego. You're willing to be raped by San Diego. Am I allowed to go with all of my, uh, my full brevity of analogies and metaphors for yeah, this? You, you be yourself, Floyd. This okay, because I just invented that one, but I stand behind space, it. This is safe space, Floyd. This is no one's there to judge. You know, I'm just going to publish this on YouTube. It's free to public <laughs> to judge. It's all good. Okay. I mean, as long as there's view counts. But as long the, as there's what? View counts? Yeah, say anything. Say anything provocative. Mm, yeah. I'm but uh, you, came, you came to San Diego four years back from Dayton, Ohio with your kid. Right? Yeah. Which is a great thing to have a kid. Yeah. It's a tough thing to have a kid. Mm. I, I don't know. I've never been in those shoes. Um, I'm kidding. I love my kid. Just for the job. I need to get that. Okay, yeah. go ahead. That was a nice press press release. Press release. <laughs> Just need to look. Like, that was a joke. I but do love my kid. Go ahead. You, I, I love your kid, too. Not as much as maybe you do, but I, I do have an affinity towards your kid. <laughs> not, in a, not, in a, not in a bad way, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, yeah. But, uh, but you came here with your kid, and look at you now. You're well settled. Every time I come to your place, it's 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 um, it's upgrading. It's it's <laughs> leveling up, and uh, you're settling down. And um, so, tell me this. So you said, you know... Um, up in you as you prefer San Diego to Dayton, Ohio, right? Um, and you are, you're, you're pro- I mean, you're not a profession, quote unquote, but you are, uh, you were a life coach, but now you're com- focused on. Well, I still do life coaching. I mean, what I do now, and that's what I've been doing for several years, is I do life coaching. Now, where I branch off and how I differentiate myself from maybe my peers is I'm what you would call a logical life coach. So a lot of people in my profession, they will say a lot of these things like, just manifest it. Just just manifest the parking spot. Manifest. He'll stop drinking. He'll stop your life. Just manifest the weight loss. It's like, I think that's, that's fucking stupid. Okay? Um, I think it's not even stupid. It's illogical. It's easy. It's easy, and it's easy to take people's money, and it's easy to say, like, if it doesn't work, well, then, oh, you just didn't manifest hard enough. Try again. And so, again, a lot of people give a lot of crappy advice, and you know me more intimately I would consider myself spiritual. I'm not religious, I would not say. And so what I do in life coaching and throughout the, all of the years I've done it is, again, I try to make it, I think a lot of times we can use logic and we might not be able to, to put words to these ineffable things, but we can remove fallacies and false beliefs that we have, and that can help us navigate the terrain of human existence and suffering more safely. So to your point, yeah, I've done life coaching. I did that more general. So I did a lot of uh, with it was addictions or weight loss or, uh, you know, I got anxiety, I'm ang- whatever, all of these just life coaching things. But I did it with a logical bent. It was never any claims that I didn't have like, like sound logic to support. It wasn't like go manifest it or this way. So I did that. Um, and then now I've since kind of focused into like niche it more into just dating and relationships because, well, to be honest with you, man, it gets fucking hard. Like, you know, you know, with certain people, like you got to, again, it's different, man. But if you got an addiction, I had a lady that, you know, I probably should, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, she died. Okay. And those things get hard. And, um, and also it can just be challenging, and some of it wasn't that rewarding. Like, no offense, I helped a lot of people, like, lose weight. But that's not, man, again, I'm like, I get a lot of clouds of depression, dude. I got to have something to pull me out of that. And it's like, let's get up today to help Rebecca lose fucking five pounds. It's like it's not that's exciting, but it pays the bills. So now what I've done is to kind of more get a better image and professionalize it is just take kind of like, and also, and I guess I'll, I'll stop at this, but what I noticed doing that was almost every time, like I might get a client and it might be initially, oh, I have anxiety or, oh, I want to get a job or I want to lose weight. What I found is that inevitably it ended up with, okay, I got the job, but it was like, I want to get this relationship. I want to have someone, as Ram Dass says, to walk home with, right, to, to this thing called death. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I found that that was kind of a, a theme throughout all of it. So now I'm just focusing strictly on um, dating and relationships and not like pickup artist stuff 
but dating for committed relationships, which I don't think there's enough of that. Yeah, no, uh, we, I think we, uh, we talked about this on Wisdom, which is an app, it's a slight plug, uh, Wisdom is an app uh, for forecasting uh, for people who has the, with, with, with some wisdom to impart, uh, also dangerous people with <laughs> long wisdoms. But uh, Floyd, is, Floyd is there every, every most, most, almost every day. Maybe Monday through Friday, baby. Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Um, <laughs> in the sauna. 4 to 5 p.m. But we talked about this on Wisdom that, um, you know, I had questions about this, like, uh, what made you become a coach? Like, period. Like, yeah. What made you become that? And it seems like um, there was a lot of suffering. There was a lot of suffering from the onset of when, you know, from, as you said, like, you know, Dayton, growing up in Dayton, Ohio, and... Being in, being a father to a child without a mother, it's. It, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's. It's. I don't want to use the word traumatic, but it was very powerful to have that at a very young age. Yeah, I mean, I think. Well, to your point, uh, and I've learned to reframe. It can post traumatic. Uh, when we have PTSD, can also turn into post traumatic growth. And so there's like two ways to look at it, and I've looked at it both ways. I'm not, I'm perfect. And I think, yeah, I mean, through that, whether it was the death of my mother or me being 400 pounds or, you know, addicted to Percocet or, you know, my aunt being a prostitute or, you know, my mother, my dad is not on my birth certificate. You know, he used to come over, give me a three musketeers bar, fuck my mom and leave before I was awake the next day. And I remember just begging him, could you just stay for breakfast? Cause it's like not safe outside to play. I'd like to go outside and play. And my mom says, it's not safe to go outside and play, but I figure you around, maybe these big guys would stop scaring her if you just stay. And he never did. And so I think all of that does honestly affect what I do now. I mean, I think that there is something, um, you know, to have some thought, to use a little logic before we start, you know, rubbing genitals, making babies. And, uh, and yeah, so that definitely affects why I do what I have done. You're like Robin Hood. But in, but in uh, dating, ah. I mean, you're giving power or love to people who don't have it from the people. Yeah, I wish I could say that. <laughs> it would but, okay, so, you, okay, so Floyd is a love coach, a dating coach, logic. I call it love logician is, is the new moniker. But again, I would say just, Instagram. I'm a logical life coach. I mean, and then there's subsects on that. Everybody has their own term, but essentially... Yeah, man, I'm a, I'm a life coach, or that's what I do, right? That's the, that's the, the, the moniker I carry around. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a logical life coach. Because again, a lot of people, we're in a new age. You know, used to be we're, we're, we're more agnostic or not religious than ever before. A lot of people I found had clients, again, things they were struggling with. These are things in the past you would have like a pastor or a friend. And even in America, on top of that, we don't have families. And it's more and more we're separated and everybody in America, even especially in San Diego, you can live in a building of a thousand people and not know a damn thing about 999 of them. Absolutely. And, and, and everybody, and what I've seen when I walk around, as I see these buildings and they're full of people, but there's no community and they're all, they all feel so alone and they're all suffering because they're so alone, but they're literally 10 feet away from someone i see that in america where they're insulated even though social media is a huge thing and you know with tiktok and snapchat they're very insulated and isolated within their own space it's i don't know why that is man i mean from i mean you know coming from india um i uh there is a sense of community there there is a sense of like you know if but it could be like, you know, they don't have any boundaries with that community. Like if there is there's something going on in your household, they would, you know, poke their nose into our business, which is kind of, I don't like it, which I kind of like in America where they don't care about you know, what happens in your apartment. You know, who are you dating? Yeah. What are your future plans with your job? But <laughs> also th there's a flip side in that, man. You feel, you feel alone sometimes in America. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and... I mean, it's like a couple of the things. So, yeah, I mean, you, with the Indian culture, you have that, and it gives you a sense of belonging. You have something. Yes. And, uh, and the thing is, is people can have that even if they weren't necessarily born in India. They get that. There's a certain cultural thing. Now you take that, and to tie it back to Dayton and all this stuff. There, 
what the fuck culture am I going to say I'm happy to be? White American? What am I? Then I sound like racist instantly. I'm not almost by definition in the milieu in which I was born. There's no daddy on my birth certificate. I can't say I'm proud to be fucking white. What? What is that? You, you go to Walmart and buy guns. No, I don't want that, Vinny. Oh, you don't want that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't want that. You're not trolling me into... But again, that's it. That's the shitty thing is that we're... And that's so you say, why America? I think that's why. We have literally disintegrated any idea of culture. It's nice for melting pots. It's nice for capitalism. It's nice to get people clocking in and clocking out. Make money. It's terrible for your fucking soul. Yeah, and with you, you are interested into Eastern philosophies. And, you know, because I've, whenever I've hung out with you, you, I mean, the last time I hung out at your place, it was a bonfire. It, it kind of seemed like a model UN where <laughs> people from all over the world were over there. I don't know, from Estonia, from India, from Portugal, Belgium. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, it's funny that, you know, have, has anyone told you that, like, being a white American, like, you, um, you know, uh, how do you, where do you get that from? Like, to, to know more about other culture? Because a lot of white Americans, I don't think they, they don't even have a passport, but how do you, where do you get that from? I don't think I know. You don't think you know? They think they know. Why would you ask questions if you think you know? <clears throat> they think, wh what do you mean? They know. I mean, if it, so if I go into it, well, imagine two situations. Imagine I go into interacting with you, and I think I know you. And this is important for relation. I, when I coach in couples and even dating, if we go in, I think I know you. Yeah. Relationship's dead. It's done. I've in my mind. This is who this person is. I know. I know Indians act this way. I know Portuguese people act this way. I know. I know. I know. And what that does is that kills curiosity. The second I kill curiosity, then I'm not engaging. There's no relation. And so I think, yeah, like if people say that, they have. But I think it's why is it like that? It's because I don't think I know. I don't think I know what it's like to be Indian or Portuguese or Belgian or any of that shit. So I ask questions. I don't tell people what I know about India when I meet an Indian. They smell like curries, actually. <laughs> There is a time when you cook curry at my house. You did smell like curry in defense of. Yeah, I know. Um, actually, at your place, you know, I met uh, met this white American where, um, you know, where she said all. In, that's a problem, right? When, when when someone says, you can say you smell like curry. That's yeah. fine. Then you say all Indians smell like curry. That's that's <sighs> that takes. I know that it's easy. It's like you said, manifest that, manifest this. It's easy. It takes a cognitive load off of your head to just put all of those people in one bracket which is i don't think it's racist i think it's ignorance right yeah i mean you don't want to know exactly well again notice that's exactly the similar thing on a macro level or for her she thought she knew and remember she her, her logic was flawed i think i remember you telling me she said well i heard that all races smell like the food they ate yeah they what? sweat they they, they sweat uh, the, the the smell of the sweat uh, smells like the food they ate. Yeah, which is, again, we know our cells in our body, most of them change over within, like, seven days. You have, like, all new cells. So that's just, it's impossible that you could smell like your fucking ancestors, dude. You smell like the KY jelly from, no, I'm just kidding. You don't smell like Yeah, no. You smell like cheap whiskey, you know? Maybe that, that's a logical statement. But to say that you smell like curry because your fucking grandparents are from India, dude, that's just... It's just illogical. It's, just, it's intellectually lazy. Yeah, and it's not that, you know, we take offense in, with it. It's like, what? It's like, what are you saying? And, you know, and you experienced this, and coincidentally, that person was also from Ramona, and you experienced this. You got almost killed in Ramona, didn't you? Yeah, it was beautiful. Go back to where. But, I mean, that's just a lot of hate in the world. I think hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. That's interesting. And interesting people are interested. I told I said that to you before, huh? I don't remember. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's okay. So okay. So coming back to you know with with what you do, being a love logician, your Instagram handle is. Really it's just, it's love logician. I mean, and I do logician. dating and relationship coaching. If we want to make it simpler, but yeah, I love logician is a way to kind of because a lot of the dating advice I find is just like it's not logical. 
And I think a lot of people get, get screwed by that. It's like they're given this map to follow, but the map's incorrect, and the people keep doing everything that the map says to do, but it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. And I think they're harmed by the, by the false beliefs. So that's why I, f- I say love logician, but it's dating and relationship coaching with that logical bent, you know, because all magic is a method. Science is beautiful. Science is like magic, but it's real. No, absolutely. And dude, I mean, so from my perspective, right? I mean, if you're having a discussion on uh, dating coach, dude, I see uh, girls and guys in their like early 20s becoming a life coach. What do you think about that? Okay, so back to why I did this. There's different kinds of people that come to this. You're right. Some people come to it, to life coaching. And that's why I say they come to it because they want to be a life coach. Because they want to live the Instagram life. Because it's like they want to be looked up as some like savior, some saint. I help people. I'm the new, you know, I'm like a new preacher. Uh, They want the lifestyle. They want the adoration. They want the title of it. You know, I've met people, I know people that are rich. They, they've done a software engineer, but they've, they call themselves life coaches. But they, I, I asked them, like, have you ever been paid for this? Have you ever? No. Like, but you just walk around, like, you tell people, which is fine. Now, me, go ahead if you have a question. No, go ahead. No, it's just, that's one camp. And I think a lot of times young people, not every person, but a lot of times young people get into it because they just want the title. Whereas, like, some people get into it just because it's just suffering and you just and you have your soul crushed so much and you are so fucking broken and you feel like there is nowhere to go for help there is no modality that fits your personality there is there is no way and you you literally have you either so you make a way out of it you know you, you you find a way to to solve this this puzzle that has you know pervaded your life and when you do that then like for me when i did that you know again if i shake a Percocet addiction. I, you know, I lose 200 pounds. I, uh, you know, my son's mother dies. She, you know, she's going through in and out of rehabs and I'm raising a kid and I'm, and so I'm doing these things and people see me do it and they say like, and that's how it got started with me. I was like, Oh, I want some of that sauce. Like, how are you doing that Floyd? How do you do this? I'd like to, you know, lose weight. I'd like to be less anxious. I'd like to be less angry. And so, but for me, how I got it was I didn't go at it to be a life coach. I didn't go, oh, I want to be a certified life coach. It was, I was suffering. And so that's what got me reading, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita and, and Hindu philosophy or Taoist philosophies or psychology. It was because I was suffering. I didn't do it to pass a test. I do it to fucking fix my soul and save my kid's life. You, I've, I've read this somewhere that, you know, when you, you truly feel content, which is which is the opposite of dukkha, which is discontentment with the way the Buddha described, um, by helping or by helping people. Like, I mean, you can give them money, you can, you can, you can give them food, you can give them all the material things, but then if it's, if it's, if it's genuine help, if you're being kind to other person, it implies that you have a good relationship with yourself first. Or... Mm. Um, you've you've seen the pain, you've, you've endured the pain in your life, and you don't. You're kind enough uh, to not let anyone go through the same pain that you, that you did, and because you know it's and and I get it, and I'm not saying you. I'm saying like you know when because we've met a lot of people uh, on wisdom or wherever that they're pseudo life coaches, where you know, or there's a book. There's a treasure hunt. <laughs> My freaking course. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just curious because um, it, it, it just, you know, because I've never, um, let alone a friend, I've never been associated with, uh, you know, I've never talked even to, to coaches. You know, I've talked to therapists, but not to like, um, like coaches, like life coaches. Yeah. And I think uh, just a different. So you're right it can be different but and it's a new thing this coaching phenomenon this is coming out more but the difference between a therapist because i don't want to say like i uh, as coaching is is replacement for therapy or that you should you know i'm not making those proclamations what i think is important is it's like i look at it kind of like this like if if you have uh, a therapist is really good at like if you want to diagnose your past if you want to uh look at things and label things 
And sometimes that's there's value to this. I'm not discrediting this. Like to value, like I don't feel secure because you know I was I whatever had this thing in my past that was traumatic, right? And 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 uh, and I don't need to diagnose it. Or if you need medication, right? Some people are there could be some adaptive uses for medication where people could need to take things. Um, so that that's there, there's a again I've had clients that go to even. Uh, psychologists and stuff in therapy so it's not like uh, one or the other whereas what a coach does is a coach does it helps i help people do that in reality so like you can do that you can know it's different knowing doesn't mean understanding i can know in my heart i shouldn't be sleeping with this girl but then there she is man and then there and my therapist tells me this is bad and you're doing this because of your shitty attachment style and you're you hate women because your mom was mean and but then you there it is and then next thing you know, and then it doesn't happen. So a coach does, again, a coach, if you think about it like in sports, a coach, we do these things in practice. We find ways to practice these things so that when the big moments come in the game and there's five seconds on the clock and the girl of your dreams is right there and the moment's shining and the lights are bright and your stomach feels weird, we can execute in those moments. Um, because a lot of a lot of times, like things don't happen when you're prepared for it. It's it's often when you're unprepared, and you know, when just like life is full of surprises in that way. Like you know, you you're fully prepared. Like it, it happens to me when I go out with like you know with I take a shower and then I you know put makeup on and I put my best clothes out and then no one you know nothing <laughs> happens, man. But then when I you know I just wake up from my slumber or a nap and then I go out. There's that hot girl out there. So are you saying that I have to be always prepared? In, the, in life uh, okay so that would also be another extreme I would say this is where wisdom is not intelligence but wi the wisdom there's great wisdom and in insecurity it's vulnerability yeah I mean now we're still in that because that's Alan Watts he wrote a book I read, but it's like the wisdom of insecurity which I being vulnerable yeah the, the willingness to, to be vulnerable and maybe that's what it is maybe you could say it a different way but yeah to be vulnerable but to do it in a way that is, is both, at least for a man, is very strong and kind together. That doesn't happen a lot. Many people show vulnerability as virtue signaling these days. Exactly. They just, they just, you know, they just come out and right off the bat they, they tell you, I'm, um, you know, I'm fucked up. <laughs> I'm a loser. I don't have a job. Yeah. You know, I just get unemployed, unemployment benefits. So, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, and they, they just, they just, leech uh, or they, they 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 prey on um sympathy i think they they they, they, they like sympathy and they they manipulate and that's manipulation and yeah and and i think you you told me about this where there's a lot of simps s-i-m-p simps yeah in, the, in this world where they're extra nice where they they show their vulnerability to manipulate people to get the what they want to get that woman in their bed right yeah, and it's still the same thing. I mean, again, it's manipulation. Whether you're the pickup artist or you're the simp, like if I have my female clients, those are the same things. They just want to manipulate you for something. You know, it's hard. And again, to be nice to someone without a reward, but again, this is hard for a man to do too. To be nice, to give, that's true vulnerability. That takes courage. I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to throw this out here. I'm going to buy your dinner. I'm going to take you on a date. I'm going to say, hey, I like you, lady. I would like to take you on a date. And I'm going to be genuine and then, oh, uh, it might, you know, you can reject me. I'm not doing it to fuck you. I'm not doing it to get you to be, I'm doing it just because it feels nice. feels right. It's not conditional on anything. Yeah, just because I want to do it. Again, the, the geek to set your, you know, uh, on the, pro set your heart on the process, not the reward or the work, not the reward. Absolutely. And dude, I mean, you can sense it, dude, even not just dating. When, when someone is outcome oriented, just from the beginning, it's just, they're so anxious to get there. It's just like, when you're, when you're on a date, they, all they want to do is fuck. And they're just like, okay, when does the check come in? I just have to pay the bill. And yeah. just, uh, there's We're a almost friction, there's an energy. There's, yeah, dude. It's and it can be, even our own heads, we get programmed that. We get programmed that as a young child. I mean, think about this, Vinny, when you went to school, they put us in schools. Most most humans go through this now in the, in the world. You go to first grade and you try real hard to learn the numbers and then learn a couple words because you want to get to second grade. Mm -hmm. And then you get to second grade. They're like, all right, if you do all this other shit, you're going to get to third grade. And then you go to fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh. And then you get into high school. And they're like, all right, you got to get through this and get these grades. And you can go to college. And then like, holy shit, yes, college. And then you go there. 
And then all of a sudden, you've been playing this linear fucking game, and then college ends, and then you're talking to guys like me, because you're like, what the fuck do I do? All I think is linearly. I just think about, should I fuck her? Or I think about, is he going to be my husband? And then you think about him being your husband the whole day you're with him, and you're fucking mind-fucking your brain. You're missing all the red flags he's showing you, and you're just seeing his best self. You're seeing him for all he could be. I love when you talk like that. Because it's bullshit. This is what most of the life coach, just see them for what they, see people for what they could be, not for what they are. No, fuck that. See I them. could change them. Yeah, no, but if you could fuck, if, if a woman could fuck a man to get that man to love him, all prostitutes would be married and all motherfucking men would be in love, man. Okay, some prostitutes are married, right? No? I said all would. If you could, I'm not saying, if you could have sex with a man, this is, my, this is my premise here, and you can shoot this down. If you could have sex if a prostitute could have sex with a man to make a man love her, all prostitutes would be married and all men would be in love. I thought all prostitutes were transgenders going through surgery, at least the ones I ordered. Uh, but, but, um, you're a pro-trans <laughs> prostitute around here. And again, still be a prostitute, just don't think you're going to hey, get married. Hey, 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 sex worker. Please. Sex worker. They have new Sexual. terms. They have new terms. But, um, yeah, no, absolutely. Like, you know, but you're not, it's, it's all about what if you if you truly seek happiness if you truly seek contentment do you need a man or do you need anyone that's my question um well the, here's the fact in the buddha if you're seeking you're seeking contentment you're already that's that's flawed in the initial first premise you've already fucked yourself because you're still thinking in that first grade to second grade second grade to third grade where is it coming? Where is it coming? Because even if after you're enlightened, then what's next? After enlightened, then, then uh, what's, you know, <laughs> yeah, where is it at? Yeah, where is it going? Like graduate to the next <laughs> level. It's like Mario or some shit. No, man, it's not. It's not. But I think it can be. Well, this is the weird thing in life I've learned from making changes and helping other people do it is that it's a paradox. As I change the way I look at things, nothing changes but then everything changes. Like I used to look at McDonald's like it was great. Dude, I used to eat a lot. Nothing changed about McDonald's. I could go there and get the same shit I could get. That Percocet that, doc that doctor gave me, I could get that same thing. Those things did not change. But once I changed the way I look at them, my whole fucking world changed. Because the world is inside you. It's your consciousness. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. You, again, you're the second trickiest Indian I know. The first one, uh, the ultimate truth, Bodhidharma, founder is in. The ultimate truth is beyond words. All doctrines are words. Oh, yeah. No, all, all doctrines are words. Uh, science uh, com, you know, includes or comprises of um, rules, frameworks, theorems. Well, but just to differentiate, and this is why science and religion are different, and if some people conflate these things, but... The beauty about science, so in science, different than religion and other doctrines, you get credit. Like my girlfriend, she is a, uh, a biochemist. Dude, if she can prove someone wrong in science, she wins fucking trophies, dude. If she finds a new thing of chemistry that she found out someone was doing it wrong, here's a new way to do it better. If she does that, the whole scientific community applauds her. She becomes – so that's science. Science is open to new ideas because it – it is it's never, there's no doctrine. It's always, people are trying to prove Einstein wrong right now. And he's like a great, and, and people want to do that. And so, whereas in religion, conversely, and in other dogmatic uh, traditions, if I come out and say, you know what, Muhammad's wrong, and I could show you, fucking, they want to kill you're me. Dead. You're dead in Saudi Arabia. It, it, or even in, we look at the Catholics thing, same times, like Galileo, when they were like, oh, I don't think the earth, uh, I don't think the sun revolves around the earth. I think the earth revolves, oh, fuck, you know, you can't say that. Bro, the earth is flat. This is the same shit, dude, that we can't, so that's where, that's why, again, when I say I'm logical, I think that's the important differentiation there, is that if we can leave everything up to, in questioning and debate, and then we find our best premises we have, and we navigate those. And if some new piece of evidence comes along to me, then I'm not attached to these beliefs. I let that go, and I have the new uh, foundation. No, absolutely. I think, the, like, yeah, the, dif the major difference that you talked about with science is uh, it's the logic part of it, the aspect of logic. And, uh, and with religion, when it comes to religion, I think... Um, 
it is a convenient distraction for not facing what's out there, right? I mean, if I believe in, like, you know, I was brought up a Hindu. Uh, if I believe in one of the gods of the thousands out there, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be successful. What is the logic in that? You know, I've had a conversation with my grandmother, who's a he was who's a devout Hindu, and if I go to temple every day and pray, mom, I'm uh, granny, na- nanny. <laughs> Would I would I make it through high school? And she's like, Yeah, I, you <laughs> Just will. pray. You will, dude. I barely made it through high school, <laughs> but didn't pray hard enough. Yeah, man. And you know, it's just blinded belief. Uh, you know, and I, dude, I get it. I mean, you need certain level of spirituality in you. You have to believe in something, or you could be nihilistic, right? Like you have to believe in. And for some, not all people are capable enough to like enlightenment. You know, nor all. You know, not all people have the capacity to just stop work, you know, and stop all this distraction and to just, I'm enlightened, you know, I don't need God. They need hope, right? They need, they need to look, they need to have something to look forward to. And I think religion gives them that, like, oh, you know, I am going to give you a God. He knows all the answers to you, all your queries. Please, please come meet my secretary, Pope, <laughs> Pope Francis. <laughs> Everything's directed through him. Yeah, I kind of. Uh, there is a certain thing in human nature we like some certainty, and we don't get certainty. We like control. Yeah, and then maybe even then, yes, yeah, certainty and control. Certainty, so we can control to know. Hey, it's gonna even us, right? We kind of like to know. Kind of, I parked my car outside. It's gonna. It's kind of nice to know that it'll be there, and I want to believe that. But netty, netty, man, that's not it, dude. It's not. That's not how it works. But. It's, it's a guarantee that it will be there. It makes you relax a little bit. It could. Well, there's two ways to go. And this is to get us from the linear thinking, which can leave us anxious and, and, and disappointed, versus the presence and powerful and still. So the there is no guarantees. And this is where I think faith and belief, people use those things synonymously. Like I have faith. I have zero belief. Faith is a surrender to what is. It's just a, you know, here's what it is. I fall into it and, you know, maybe it's not there. Maybe it is there. My car gets stolen. I still have faith that it's, it's going to, that it is, that I can just, I don't need to cling to these things. I don't need to cling to these linear uh, destinations. Whereas a belief is a, it's an assertion. I believe no one will take my car. Mm. I believe I'm going to have sex with her. Mm. You're fucking it all up. You're already messing it all up to start out. I believe I'm going to win. It's nice. It's nice. But what's much better is we can have faith, which is also what's important. Have faith that, hey, I can go out here. I can approach this lady and we can, I can have fun. And this isn't going to end. I'm not going to end my life. It's not, nothing bad's going to happen. Nothing, you know, irrevocably bad is going to happen. It's not final. It's not linear. I can still have faith to what is. Because your happiness is not conditional on whether you have her or that or this or a god. It's not conditional because everything you want is is right here, right now. It's like Alan Watts said, right? Like, or from the Eastern philosophies, uh, Tao Te Ching or whoever. It's 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 superbly flawed. Life is superbly flawed. It's not you know there is no book, there is no religion out there. To, I mean, it, it can help people to make some sense of this chaotic world, but it's a distraction. At the end of the day, um, it doesn't answer all the questions. And like you said, it's an assertion. It's like, I believe in something, and that's the truth. Final. At least science says, I don't know fully what's what's the answer to some questions. I don't know. Yeah, yeah we know these. Like we know this is how gravity works at this level. Once we go quantum, we have no idea. Right. And then before that, Newton knew like, hey, I get how planetary gravity works in this level. And then, you know, you know, Einstein goes space time. Yeah. So it's it's always I've heard it said as the as our knowledge grows, so, too, does the boundary of our ignorance. Mm. Yeah, because, dude, as your knowledge grows, it's it's funny because you know there's a lot of people out there who like you said there's a linear method of uh, gaining knowledge like from first grade to doctorate it's all linear right and they forget because they would be 
beautiful and brilliant at what they do. You know, they could be forensic scientists or they could be, you know, uh, space traveler, whatever. But do they know how to, what's, what, what's the quality of the life they're leading? Does that, is, does meaning that you are good at doing one thing in life mean that you're good at life in, in the totality of life? It's just, because we have seen, dude, you're a love coach. We have seen like, we have hung out with people that they want something and they, their lifestyle is entirely different. It's very contrasting, it's stark. Yeah. And, and, you, and I think we talked about this, it's like, dude, like, you know, they, they have a, they're, they're scientists, they're, you know, they're doctors. How could they think so illogically? But, yeah, dude, wow. It's just, it's all I want to say is how fucked up our education system. <laughs> but but I, I, I used to think that, and this is again, this is the this is why I think we're seeing the rise in, of coaches, personal coaches, life coaches. Again, the million monikers, whatever, dude. But it's because this idea that traditionally, it's a very recent thing. Nietzsche uh, said, uh, "God is dead, and we have killed him." Okay, God is dead and we have killed him with science. And if you look at this, just look around you if, if you're listening for a minute or, or watching. Look at all the things around you that we used to ascribe to divine gods. Uh, when lightning came down from the sky, we thought that was Zeus. The ocean we saw waving, we thought that was a god. We thought that the stars shooting through the sky, those had to do with gods. Science has slowly eroded every little thing where we used to have spiritual meaning, where we used to have gods, and, and now, no, it's not. Fucking, you know, uh, science says, nope, that's not it. That's actually, da, 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 da. you know, weather is actually this. Here's barometric pressure, and here's this, da, da, da. we can pretty much predict it. And, and so the reason I guess this is important is, and we see the, the rise of coaches, is so we've killed God, right? We've killed this spirit, our, our, our kind of only spiritual tradition. We laugh at Hinduism and Catholicism and every fucking religion we laugh at. How could you believe that? But the thing is now we haven't replaced it with anything. We have an education system we kind of have tried to replace it with, but that's linear. It teaches you how to put your name on the top right corner. It teaches you how to spell stuff, how to read a book. It doesn't tell you how to live a life. It doesn't tell you how to, who do I, who do I rub genitals with? These are things religious texts would talk about. Who do I rub generals with? Who do I be friends with? When someone punches me, how do I handle that? If my kid, if my kid gets aggressive, what do I do? Do I punch him? Do I not hit him? Do I hit a girl? Do I not hit a girl? Why don't I hit a girl? What's the difference between men and women? Those are things that are spiritual in nature that we have totally science has gotten out of. And then we think, oh, we don't need it. But then to your point, I have many clients. We can see people with PhDs that they are brilliant intellectually. But their soul is fucking crushing, man. No, absolutely, dude. I it just it just brought me back memories from when I was in school. At least you guys, did you have sex education? Sex education? Uh, uh, a little bit, yeah. Like a sixth grade, I think we got our first. Dude, we never had sex education, dude. We had a chapter um, in in our biology class called reproduction, and they totally fucking skipped it. I was looking forward <laughs> to it the whole fucking year, and they totally, <laughs> fucking, they totally fucking skipped it. And they had the the, the fucking uh, diagrams of like um, you know a vagina. Mm, the nice I'd vulva. like to know. I'm just curious, man. Yeah, I still am trying to figure that thing because, out because because I. Dude, you know when I figured out like how babies are made, I thought they exchanged urine. <laughs> or <laughs> I don't know, there was semen. You thought you were peeing out baby. Like I think I'm peeing a couple kids. No, I thought the guy would be in the women's mouth. Kind of like the guy you talked to the other day. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, she she would get uh, she get a pee baby. <laughs> And, and, and that's, this is funny, but I think the, the, the truth and jest of this that is important to kind of hit on is that, so if we like science, the, we say our brain is 180,000 years old, has not changed much. The hardware, we could take a baby in a time machine from 180,000 years ago, bring him to today, and I could raise that baby. They would be, you would not be able to recognize that baby from any other baby. They have all the same hardware. So 180,000 years, same hardware. Now... 18,000 years, roughly, agricultural revolution. So from 180,000, 160,000 years of this, we were hunter-gatherers. There was no civilization. There was no big communities and tribes. You, Dude, if we're growing up, man, we saw people having sex. 
There was no fucking hotel rooms for your daddy to go fuck your mommy in. You know? You gonna hear him. There was no confusion. You didn't have to worry with they peeing in the mouth. Boy, you saw that pressurized vein can get up and him get out. You well, know? yeah. <laughs> Did I realize that when I saw a Bollywood dance? But anyway, go but, ahead. But I'm saying, so again, this is what you're saying. This is why it's important. So now we live in a culture where, so we don't, we have missed this intrinsic thing. Then religion comes along. So about 20,000 years ago, agriculture revolutions, we start getting cities, etc. Then you see religious traditions. And some of the oldest religious traditions are uh, in, in uh, India. Um, and we see these traditions and what they're trying to do, in my estimation, is they're trying to tell us, so we have these cities, how do I live a life? Because we've started to separate. We have to divide labor. Some people got to be in the fields. We've got houses. We've got rich people. We've got poor people. Maybe we both have a farm, but maybe, you know, the rain didn't rain much on mine. So now I don't have any food. You have all the food. And now I got to do something to get food from you to feed my family. Tough shit. You know, I'm gonna Tough. Get- I know, but I got to, maybe I got to give you my daughter. Maybe I got to, and it becomes all of these new things, these modern things that our brains weren't built to do. So you see religious traditions pop up and try to guide this. Now, this is why this is important. We killed all those religious traditions, but we don't see still how the chicken nuggets are made, so to speak. We don't see how the babies are made. And then we, we literally pervert our youth in the name of some holy thing. We pervert them because they don't know. They're used to, I'm supposed to be able to see how a baby's made. Show me what happens. Yeah. You know, even now, when I, I had when my kid was born, kids, babies, women get pregnant, and you just see them go to the hospital. The door closes. They come out, and they're all clean and happy. You don't see them fucking screaming and bleeding and fucking fluid everywhere and mm. sweating. That's real. Mm, we, 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 we try to look at this lotus and forget all of this mud that goes with it. And I think to your point, yeah, and then it makes us, and then as kids wonder, and then we wonder why we have all of these uh, 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 what we call mental illness which is really just kind of a spiritual sickness that's kind of disconnected from who we are. Yeah, dude, absolutely. Because, dude, there's also an argument for that is that, like, when, you know, kids are really impressionable, they, you know, when they're young, you can't show them all the nitty gritty parts of life. Uh, But uh, fortunately, uh, I, majority (laughs) of my childhood (laughs) was uh, was, uh, spent on the nitty gritty parts. Um, And dude, and I'm not saying I could appreciate the mud or the lotus, but you dude, there are nitty gritty parts in life. And the more you fucking avoid it, you're running away from it for the fucking flower. And then you're avoiding it. You know, the more you avoid it, the more it chases you. Because, you know, like you said, I mean, we'd have this conversation, right? With the even with the because I because I like movies with Disney, you know when 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 I when I go to um, when I go and talk to people and you know kids are watching Disney movies, great, but don't believe this is life because mm-hmm. life doesn't guarantee you a happy ending. Life doesn't have twists and climaxes. Life, you know, there's no like we said, there's no uh, Snow White coming to uh, Prince Charming. You know, it's it's yeah, it's fake. rare. That's it's, very yeah. It's fucking fake, you know. But, um, but, dude, I mean, yeah. With your, with what you said, um, I think you, from from an early age, our the whole system is fucked because they're taught to be great at science, mathematics, or I don't know, fucking social studies. I don't know, but they're not taught to how to live a fucking life, or even ask, what do you want to do? It's given, like. Go to first grade. This is what we have. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And we and the thing is that is actually a necessity of modernity, of of civilization, as we call it. To have all these workers, and this is what Hinduism, I think, with the castes and such, and I think it has probably been perverted because it's old, right? But I could see a reason early on to have to explain, like, hey man, we're all one part of this body. We need feet, we need arms, we need a head. And we can't all be the head. The head, you know, my heart can't breathe for my lungs. My, my, my hands can't pump blood for my heart. They all have a job and they have to do it for me to work together. Sorry, I just kept the barrier down. What, it no, is sorry. a conjunction with it has to work with everything because you can't just, you know, how would you, if you don't have left hand, you just have right hand. How on earth would you masturbate? No, uh, wow, sorry. it takes you two hands. Jesus, I'm really... <laughs> that whole fucking brown ding-dong gonna, thing I'm is true. Publi- I'm going to publish this. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Did 
dude, you should. You're going to really be Scotch and soda. But we didn't get to the meat of this podcast, Floyd. The meat of this mm. podcast is your is uh, funerals and pimps. I read you. So Floyd has this amazing story that he shared with me. Um, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it's not, it's a, it's not a story or a, it's, it's just a part of a I wrote it for a blog. I write a lot, but I have uh, anxiety to share things. So I just write massively and just keep them and then never share them. But I shared one with you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I might publish vulnerable. it maybe when yeah, I die. Um, you, you shared it with me and I read it. It was such a fucking, again, you know, the nitty gritty things I like in life. It was full of that. It was, I loved it. And from the moment I read it, I was like, wow, that's something. It should be a movie. Um, so please go ahead. Can you, because you, can I, can I share? Yeah, go, yeah, yeah, go ahead. You tell me where to jump in. So the story is basically about um, his relationship with his, with the mother of his child. And she died um, of, of uh, heroin addiction. And then they were at a funeral home and uh, you're describing a pimp came into the funeral home and he had two prostitutes left and right. And you're descri- and you're describing the the coffin as well, which is which is shiny. And I think when the <laughs> when the pimps came in, I don't know. I mean, I don't remember the full specifics of it. Yeah. I mean, this is where you lead me. Uh, so the pimp come in with the you know two two prostitutes, and you were how old were you then? <sighs> Caleb was uh, my son was twelve maybe. So this is like four. I was like thirty, twenty nine. Maybe twenty nine. Maybe it was, oh, 20. it was like four years back. Maybe it was like yeah, twenty eight. Well, yeah, maybe twenty eight. Well, you were twenty eight. Yeah. What Around made there. you? Because you would be the only person I know that is perceptive enough to notice pimps and the two <coughs> prostitutes. Because there's a funeral happening, all the attention will be the the body, the dead body, and the coffin. But you, <laughs> you, <laughs> what 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 is it? Can you? Oh man! Well, again, see, people. Some people come to these this coaching profession differently. I came with a lot of uh, uh, I was fucked up, a lot of anxiety, had a lot, of not really the best childhood. When people, were, especially men, walking into the room, you know, when I was a kid, that wasn't always maybe the best thing. You know, there could be guys that would be drunk and violent or whatever, and so I kind of maybe just got aware of that. And then, as far as yeah, when they come in, so I was kind of perceptive of that and just seeing it, you know. And this is at this time. This was several years I'd kind of beat an addiction myself, you know, when I found out that my son's mother was addicted because I had to apologize to him because I was kind of yelling at him. He was like maybe, I remember he was like six, about six years old, uh, maybe five actually, but I was yelling at him because he was getting his video games. He was losing his Nintendo Switch games and he was losing his money. He had a little piggy bank of money. I was like, dude, you got to take care of this shit, man. Like this matters. And and then I had to apologize to him because it turned out his mother actually stole them. And I found out she was addicted to heroin. And then when I started Googling, because, you know, hey, when we were kids, I made a baby with a, with she was 16. I was 17. But, I mean, we smoked weed. We drank some some beer. We knew not to fuck with heroin. Everybody kind of knew, like, heroin's not a good thing, you know. And so I was like, there's no way she's doing heroin. Anyway, so I Google it, and I find out that... She was doing heroin, and then I find out that that heroin is essentially this. It's an opioid, which was the same thing a doctor was prescribing me. And then I had to look to my son in his eye and say, I'm sorry for yelling at you. Uh, you we, your mom's an addict, and so be careful. Maybe don't – if she tries to pick you up from school, don't get in the bus, and we're going to deal with this stuff. Just, just, just pragmatic, practical shit that you have to deal with. And then also in the back of my head, like, fuck, Floyd. This life has thrown so much on him has given him one addicted parent, and now you're ensuring he has two. Yeah, because you were taking opioids as well. I was popping them like Skittles, man. And at that point, that was, so then that's what put me down, like, the path of Buddhism and meditation and yoga and, and how to do these things and, and, and nutrition and diet and all this shit, man. Um, again, it was because I was suffering. I had to fix myself. I was, there's no family. If I die, or, that was the only thing my kid had. And so I went on that path. Fast forward, years of her going in and out of rehab, there were several times they were supposed to meet. They didn't. There was one time where my son and I walked past a subway, and we walked as close as you and I are past his mom. My kid didn't even recognize his own mom, man. This was – didn't even know. Wow. I got a text like a couple hours later. It's from his mom, 
saying, oh, I just saw you and Caleb. He looks great. Tell him I love him. Wow. And, uh, but this is life. And so, again, this happened. She tried to get her stuff together. You know, she was, uh, she tried, you know, and, you know, it didn't work out. And so there was times where she, over years, they were supposed to meet. They never saw each other again over years. So after that, the next time, essentially, my kid sees his mom, she's in a coffin. And um, unrecognizable. You know, unrecognizable. I didn't have the money at the time to kind of afford all the funeral things because I was kind of taking care of him. And so, like, the, the embalming stuff had to wait. And so, like, her, it was kind of a, a disfigured body. And they also, his, her, her mom wanted an open casket. So that happened. So, yeah. So, you know, I remember to your story um just after all this buddha and this ducka shit and all this meditation and i was just kind of like maybe years or something into that i was kind of early in it and seeing just all of it like you know the peaks the valleys like in my son's eyes there were these beautiful blue eyes i'm looking at and they're and they're so strong and i could see that they want to cry and they're tearing up and i could see like you know he's like again, 11 or something years old. And I'm like, fuck, man. Like, and he's handling it like a champ. And I see within that reflection of his eyes, I see his mother's corpse, right? And this flowers and all this stuff. And then, and then this, this charismatic black man with gold teeth and two white women with midriffs showing walks in. And I, I, it, yeah. I mean, it just, it, uh, Life is ducka, right? It's it's suffering, it's pain, it's pleasure, it's just, I mean, it just, and there's, and it just, in that moment, I guess there's solace to me to be in the middle of the, of the, of the tornado, of the middle of the storm and not be dizzied by all of the fucking suffering abound. Yeah, no, that, that is really powerful. It, you know, because it's, yeah, man, it's just not one thing. It's just not, you know, you having to take care of the child and you even took the decision to take care of a child because I know a lot of dads out there who's like, fuck it, <laughs> I'm going to accept this shit. I'm going to quit this game. But you you, uh, well. you didn't sign up. I mean, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm assuming, but I don't know if you ever signed up for this, but, you know, you got this. This was what, this was, what was handed to you and you, you know, you took it as a, I don't know, challenge or wh whatever like you 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 did stick through all of this and you know you're still here um in ocean beach uh, with your kid and a and your girlfriend joanna shout out <laughs> but um yeah dude i mean when i look at you you know i there's no vestiges of any past <laughs> opioid addiction no it man it, it is powerful it is very fucking powerful you know because Dude, I've talked to you, you know, and <clears throat> I've talked to you about these things very deeply. And whenever, because people, uh, like, m it goes back to my first impression. Like, you saw that pimp with two prostitutes with midriffs. My first impression, that was your impression of that dude. Yeah. My first impression uh, about you was, dude, yo, this is, this is, that's a loud guy. You know, that's a loud white guy. Shocking. <laughs> shocking <laughs> but but um but dude i mean the more you get to know the other person right like you ask questions you know you read the same books the philosophies that that i am interested in and and we talked and talked and i can't pinpoint what you know what what made the f and i'm not saying there there were disagreements or whatever the f you know fucked up things happened but it's just when, when i when i when i look at you it's 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 you know when What's I don't know what the eligibility for coaching is. I don't know what the degree for coaching is. But you you've gone through the suffering, or you know, in in you as you said, you're in that tornado, and you know you have firsthand experience of that suffering. And if possible, you you could tell someone how to deal with that, or not to avoid it, but to deal with because suffering, like it's inevitable in my philosophy. You, you know, because you're going to die, you know, everyone's going to die. Um, might yeah. as well, might as well. I mean, it's, a, you're, that's an inevitable life. Go ahead. Not just your philosophy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, man, I mean, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I'm not, I didn't invite you 
or I didn't I didn't want to have a podcast with you because you're my friend. It's just because uh, it's the story is very powerful because the only the only knowledge about opioid addiction in Middle America for me at least was uh, watching this docu series called Dope Sick. It's a great documentary. Um, which is crazy, dude. Which is fucking crazy, and it's so sad. It's just like kids and fucking people die, and and you have that experience, and you're sitting right there in front of me, telling me the story. It's like wow. It's, it's beautiful too, though. Yeah, no, it is beautiful. Yeah, it that's is beautiful. the paradox of it, right? It is fucking beautiful, but but yeah, man, no, it is, and you know, uh, I wish if 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 I ever die anytime soon, please bring a pimp to my funeral. <laughs> I'll have to meet one uh, if you w- want me to. I don't know. Uh, or I know a couple of. Man, I'm not gonna go to a, a funeral that's ominous. No, but uh, thank you uh, for your kind words. And yeah, I'm not. I'm just grateful. I don't know why things work out the way I, you know, I do. I mean, you're right. A lot of dads don't stay around. My dad is an example of that. You know, he's not on my birth certificate. He's not. He wasn't there. And I I don't know. I don't know why. I can't tell you why. And I can't tell you that I have the answers. I mean, today I was a little late for the podcast because I'm feeling some some clouds of of, of beautiful depression are visiting uh, quite quite heavily today. Or I won't even – I'll just stick to objective. They're visiting. And um, and what I do, though, is when I I do this meditation, I've done it for literally years now, and uh, I I do a cold shower. And one of the things I do is because I do want to help people. But like in the Gita, I want to be the help, not the helper. So I do this meditation where like I imagine myself like, you know, I'm here to, to go through all these sufferings. And I do this like like being cut by the devil's blades of anger, anxiety, addiction, depression. I visualize this and I fucking feel the suffering of it. And then I say like that's why I'm here is I – I kick the fucking devil in the, in the shorts, right in the damn ding dong. And I wink at his ass and I walk out and how I help people is not by coming to defeat the devil. I don't think he, I think it's alive in all of us, but what I do do is I'm not preaching. I'm not going to proselytize to people, but I'm going to walk into hell and I'm going to wink at the devil and I'm going to walk back out and I'm going to keep walking in there. I'm going to wink at his ass. I'm going to walk out. And that is going to, again, Lao Tzu says, if you want to, you make a path by walking it. So I'll fucking walk it. I don't, I, you could come or not. I'm not saying you, you want to stay here and suffer. Hey man, I'm not going to grab you. I'm not going to preach to you. My system of here's the five. It's like, no, but I'm going to go here. I'm going to wink at that dirty son of a bitch and I'm going to walk out and I'm going to keep doing it. That's, that's badass dude. And like, like there should be the song playing in the background. ACDC is thunder. <laughs> yeah. Thunder. Be like, <laughs> Floyd walking, walking back from the being middle. Being Giannis maybe. Me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so no, man, absolutely. It's no, the, again, you know, but uh, but unless unless you want to go over something else, we could wrap this up. No, I think uh, yeah. Thanks for having me, uh, Vinny. It was a it was a delightful delight. Oh yeah, no, um, we do this every every day. But. We do. We talk on the phone a lot. If you'd like to talk to me on the phone, like Vinny does, but you have to pay me, uh, you can check out. I think it's right now. Love Logician is the Instagram. Uh, Logical dot love coming soon. And there's also FloydJordan.com. If you want to contribute to my kid's college fund, feel free. Just click the button to do the things. (laughs) That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.